wonderful place on earth. Right here. What a thank you, William. Word of God does speak, amen. And I believe the word of God wants to speak to us today. As me and Pastor Colsey have been planning out the year, planning out our sermonic calendar, we've been looking for places that we sense the Holy Spirit leading us to grow in. Now, it could be that the Holy Spirit is leading us to grow in our personal lives. And it could be that the Holy Spirit is leading us to grow in our professional lives. And it most definitely is that the Holy Spirit is leading us to grow in our spiritual lives. Because the thing about the Holy Spirit is, the Holy Spirit ministers to us in a complete package. So today, I want to talk about relationships. And I need to say up front that a large part of the ideas I'm sharing in this presentation is to the credit of Dr. Kress, who was in our conference and came up with a lot of terminology of some of the things I'm going to share. Triangulating. It's a word you probably haven't, I maybe you've heard of it, but like, it's kind of like cryptic, right? And it's interesting. Because before Karen Kress shared this word with me, triangulating, I didn't know that Jesus warned us about this. In fact, Jesus offered a better way to have relationships. And Jesus said, triangulating must only be a last resort for Christians. So, I got a question to start off with. What is your conflict style? Hopefully your conflict style is not this one. But we all have conflict Styles. We all have personalities, and those personalities respond to conflict in different ways. So I just want you here this morning for a few minutes, just don't raise your hand. It's not testimony time. But think about the very last conflict you had. Was it driving to church with your family? Was it with that annoying coworker who got your job? Not really your job, but the job you wanted. Was it with your children? And what we might call conflicting values. And as you're thinking about that last conflict you had, I want to think about what was your conflict management style. And you don't need to know that you have one, but I'm telling you, you got one. Like some people, they meet conflict with fire. And some people, they meet conflict by avoiding everyone. And they hide from the problem. Some people compromise. How can we solve this? How can you get a little bit? And how can I get a little bit? Some people collaborate to solve the conflict. But whatever your conflict style is, whatever your, your method is, Paul tells us in Romans. Now, I want us to look at this verse very carefully. Paul tells us in Romans, if possible, 
So much as it depends on who? Me. Be at peace with all. These. Because now some of you are like, see, I knew that argument with my wife on the way in here in the car didn't count because Paul said, all men. I can say this one because I didn't have to take a car ride. I had no chance for an argument. But these things happen to us. But, but notice the text. Just notice the text. Just think about it. Paul says, if possible, as much as it depends upon you, be at peace with all people. Two things are striking about this text right away. Paul is putting a high standard on how we have relationships as Christians. And he's not putting the burden of that standard on the others, but on us. Hmm. The other thing I kind of like, the other thing that was just striking about the text, I like, but it's hard to grasp. He does not say, it is possible. Do you, are, are you reading the text with me this morning? Paul does not say, it is possible. And it does depend on you to never have conflict. Because conflict, believe it or not, is one way, not the only way, of having mature relationships that grow. But what Paul is actually saying, don't you be the cause. And do everything you can to not be the cause. But also understand that there are going to be times that we have to set boundaries. Also understand, there are going to be times that we have to address problems with people. But, when it comes to us, when it is possible, we should be at peace. Now, being at peace doesn't mean I agree with everyone. Being at peace doesn't mean they're right and I'm wrong. Being at peace is an act of the Holy Spirit living in your life, putting you in unity with whatever community you're connecting to. Because the Holy Spirit, I know you don't believe this, but the Holy Spirit, I know you don't believe this, the Holy Spirit is actually also worth those people you're conflicting with. And when we realize that, we realize that the moments that it is not possible is because one of the two parties are not engaging the spirit. And we don't want to be that party. So this is what Karen Kress taught me. A very simple concept. Like, this is the ideal communication strategy. Like, this, this communication strategy cannot fail. It's so simple. Sender, message, receiver. Right? You have a conflict coming. You don't know how to deal with it. What do you do? Send a message. Have communication. With who? One person. Whoever the conflict is with. It's simple but rarely practiced. It's simple 
but hard to do. When someone picks me off, I want everyone to know about how bad they are. And this is what happens. This is a dysfunctional communication system where the sender doesn't send to the receiver. Like, you're mad at Pastor Vinny, but you don't talk to Pastor Vinny. Um, you're mad at your boss, but you don't talk to your boss. You're mad at your spouse, but you talk to your child. So they will talk to you, your spouse. You put a transmitter in the middle of the message. And I'm here to promise you, every time you put a premature, now Jesus gives two exceptions to this rule, we'll get and get to them. But every time you, your first move is to put a transmitter, a midway person who you think is going to boost the signal, you are trans, you, you are doing the problem, you're, 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 you're triangulating. And now your message is going to go up. You don't know if the transmitter is going to send the pure message back. But I can promise you one thing you know. If it does get to the receiver, you got a problem. Because he'd be like, well, why didn't you come and talk to me? In Proverbs, it's just simply put this way. Whoever goes about slandering reveals secrets. Therefore, do not associate with a simple what? Babbler. Solomon is saying, do not associate around the work cooler where the gossip's going on. Saul, or King Solomon is saying, I know at the family reunion you want to find out all the gossip about Aunt Tallulah. Do not associate with the babbler. Because here's what happens to our triangle. This is a better word for babbler, one you might know. A gossiper. Now, question. In your life, and this is one, I will let you give a testimony on if it's true. Have you ever found a gossiper to make a community more loving, more engaging? Well, maybe engaging, but not the right way. more healthy, triangulating, creates pain points. And it doesn't matter if it's at home. It doesn't matter if it's at school. And it doesn't matter if it's at church. It's so simple. So simple that Jesus talks about it in Matthew 18. And he says, listen, if your brother or your sister, see, Jesus is a little bit more inclusive in this translation than Paul was. If your brother or sister does what? Sins or offends. And go and point out their fault. Uh, it sounds scary right there, right? For us avoiders. Well, what's it say? Just between the two of who? You. If they listen, to you, you have won them over. Now watch this. 
if your brother or sister sins. It's problematic to me in a good way. Because in my mind, no, 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 no. If you step on my toes, you better come to me and apologize. Right? If you hurt me or offend me, I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here judging you, waiting for you to show up and apologize. But remember, the world of Jesus is upside down to the world of us. And everything that seems to be natural in our world is backwards to us in his. And it's a fascinating thing here because it seems to be, if you'll stay with this point for a minute, it seems to be that Jesus is saying that it is the hurt person's responsibility The victim's responsibility to raise the awareness of the problem. That, like I'm from a social work background, that troubles me. But I'll tell you why. And you'll see it at the end of the advice too. The assumption that Jesus is making is that people who hurt other people are spiritually incapable of discerning their own wicked actions. You want a backup text? Being nailed to the cross. Forgive them, Father, for they what? And the assumption here in Matthew 18, in the one-to-one -one communication, it is the, the victim or the offended that must make the first move. Because the assumption that Jesus is making is that the other party is too, if they have done something wrong, if they have hurt someone on purpose, they are too unspiritual to be able to come and apologize. So Jesus says, you must go restore your brother or your sister. And I'm pointing out to you, this is what Jesus' primary advocation is. Straight line. Yeah, Jesus didn't say, if your brother or sister sins against you, office hours at the church are 10 to 2. Come and fill out a report. Jesus didn't even say, if your marriage is in trouble, you better call your mama or papa. Jesus said, if you have a problem, the best chance of winning that person back and healing this relationship is to contain the embarrassment of their carnal nature. And to quietly invest in restoring the kingdom of God in that person. But there's always a risk, and here's the risk. The risk is, but if they will not listen, and it does happen, right? If they do not listen, now you may start the mob. No, it doesn't say that either. It doesn't say, I've talked. They didn't listen. I'm calling a family meeting and telling everybody. Doesn't say that. It says, take one or two. And you've got to ask yourself a question right now. Because you're all saying, I'm taking two. I want to back up. I know I would say that to the situation. But so the question you get asked is, why do you even say one? 
has his preference here is to restore a carnal person, not shame them. So if one will do it, one will do it. But if you need to, take two. So that every matter may be established on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Now, but what if they don't listen to the witnesses? By the way, you caught that, right? Take one or two so that every matter will be established on what? Two or three. <laughs> that's pretty crafty. Um, that's pretty crafty for Jesus. <laughs> but if they still refuse you to listen, Tell it to the church. It doesn't have to be a church. I mean, it can be a church if you've got problems with the church. But some of you got, some of us, we have problems with our families. Some of us have problems with our neighbors. Some of us have problems at work. Whatever the community is. If you went directly, you didn't triangulate. And then you went again with two, one or two, that turned into three, somehow. <laughs> um, now you can take it to your community. Now, this is where it gets really, really interesting. And if they free, refuse to even listen to the church or the community, ah, oh, this is tough. Just gotta sit that down there and you know, my new health thing, I gotta stay hydrated. So, because this is tough. And we gotta think this one through. If they don't listen to you, they won't listen to one or two, and then you take the whole community, they won't listen to the whole community. This is where, like, ah, finally, Jesus. We get to smack them upside the head. Throw them out the doors. And point out we were the ones that were spiritually superior. And write about them the whole way long. I mean, it says it right there, right? Treat them as you would what? A pagan. Or a dreaded tax collector. I mean, I know none of us are fans of the IRS. But a tax collector in Jesus' time collected taxes from the Jews for the Romans to help oppress the Jews. They were a double-dipped betrayer. They were like Judas dipped in chocolate. So there you go. It's really simple. I'm, I'm really, really God for this because, like, you know, no one wants a, a double dip Judas in their church, right? Except for this problem. How do we treat pagans and tax collectors? And what did Jesus even mean? Remember, in step one, Jesus pointed out the offending party isn't even spiritual enough to know that they're in trouble. And Jesus basically is saying, at the end of the process, treat them what you assumed at the first of the process. that they're not even believers. Hmm. But question, how should Christians treat non-believers? Now, 
not smack them in the head and throw them out. Although there are some groups who do that kind of stuff. How did Jesus treat pagans and tax collectors? He was crucified for them. And so often we've looked at this passage through the years and we've just assumed that this, this is our road of revenge. Like we got to go through these steps to get to the good part that we get vindicated and, and we get to be made out as the heroes. No. Maybe. Maybe, maybe the point of Jesus, maybe the process was never about them, but it was to remind you of your obligation to people who aren't spiritual, to people who don't know, they don't know. Because here's the importance of it. The importance of it is this. I tell you, whatever you bind, where? In the Vienna Seventh-day Adventist Church, in the McIsaac family home, in your job placement, We will be bound in heaven. And whatever you lose on earth will be loosed where? In heaven. Jesus is telling us this morning the way we treat people in conflict has eternal consequences. And those eternal consequences don't start in heaven, they start on earth. And you can't say, they stepped on my toes, so they get to go to hell. It doesn't work with Jesus' world. Because another thing Jesus said, Sermon on the Mount, if you cannot forgive others, You cannot be forgiven. You know why? Either the cross is big enough. Either the cross is powerful enough. Either the cross is transformational enough. That it can atone for the sins of your most vile enemy. Or it's too small to atone for your sins. There is eternal consequences. To how we go about loving those. who give up. That doesn't mean there aren't consequences. This is full of consequences. But you treat them a certain way now. I'm going to close up, but I'm going to tell you how I know this. Because, oh, didn't mean to do that. I wasn't always a pastor. I once was a mouthy, rebellious, difficult church elder. And I made a particular pastor's life miserable. I mean, miserable. I can't even remember why I was... It was an important issue, I'm sure of it. 
what the issue is doesn't seem to come to mind. But he was wrong, and I know that. And the breach was so bad that we couldn't even worship in the same building together. And so they sent me out, spiritual angry me, to plan the church. And you know what? As I was planning that church, every Sabbath, Jesus is so good. Jesus is so faithful. Jesus is so trustworthy that he would send people just like me. And I knew what I had done to that man. He was still wrong, I'm sure of it. I had wronged this man. I had separated from this man. I I didn't like this man. And then he left the area and I was so happy. But one Sabbath, I found myself out at Loma Linda. Loma Linda, Seven Day Adventist University Hospital. I think we own the community. <laughs> like it's gigantic Adventist church, every place there, right? You've been there. I'm out there taking a class. And I'm in this hotel room to sleep on Friday night. And I pull out from the desk a guide of where the local churches are. And I look down, there's several Adventist churches and the pastor's name beside them. And there was his name. I could not not go. He had a tremendously big church. Our whole sanctuary would not be his balcony. And I'm going to just sneak in the church. Because it's so big, no one's going to notice I'm there. And bonus, I got there and found that it was communion. He'd have to forgive me on communion. And he would be too distracted to notice me until I snuck up on him. So I went walking in there. I was really happy. You know, I came to church. You got, don't tell me you don't know. The traditional 20 minutes late to church. You guys know what I'm talking about. Uh, my mic's working here? Oh, my coffee? I'm spilling it? Oh, well. Okay. I'm going to get into his story. I'm sneaking into his church. I'm sneaking up to his balcony. He's in the middle of passing out the ordinances. And I know he's not going to see me. He puts down the communion tray. Looks up at the, the balcony. And in front of people who never heard who I was. That's Vinnie McIsaac. The best elder I ever had. I sheepishly went down after service. He's like, you were a great elder. And I was like, I really want to say his name, but I'm not because he's alive. <laughs> and I was really mean to him. And he was really good to me. I'm like, Pastor, you, you, you have to forgive me. 
And he's like, what would I be forgiving you for? He's like, you know how we parted. He's like, you are a good elder. Come to my house. We will have lunch together. We will come back to the church tonight and we'll have a concert and you will be an honored guest. And I did. And in that moment, that pastor made me not a better pastor, a better Christian. And don't you think that those dreadful pagans and tax collectors on your street, in your office, on our pews, deserve the same kind of restitution. If possible, it won't always be possible. If possible, as much as it depends on you, give peace to all people. Because only Jesus knows who's the real sinner in any conflict. Pastor Close is right. A lot of interesting things went on behind the scenes today. But that sweet, sweet spirit is always in this space. And he is always calling to us. And the truth of the matter is, He's wanting us to extend that sweet, sweet spirit to even the most annoying, difficult, problematic people that we can. If, not always, if possible, it's not always possible. Sometimes we must set boundaries. If possible, as much as it depends on you, be at peace or bring peace. To all people, there is a connection card in your pew. There is a QR code in your pew. You may scan or hand it in the back. If you too would like to have the peace. that a 15-year-old girl showed us today. But even now I speak to those who are baptized. I am gonna pray that that sweet, sweet spirit, forgive me, will haunt you. To make it right, with those that it is possible 
to have peace with. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, the Spirit has speaking to us all year about places for our own growth, our own maturity. And yet, Father, it seems to me that sometimes I am, and if I am, probably others are too, held back from increasing my spiritual maturity because I have not been a peace bearer where you are sending me. May your spirit bring to our minds those we know it is possible and where we may even be the reason it has not been possible that we may have the love of Jesus that declared forgive them father they know not what they do This is my prayer, in Jesus' name. You may be seated.